Good morning. That was a little loud. How are we doing this morning? I'm John Cross. My wife Kathy and I are, are part of the family here at, at Lakeside. A few weeks ago, I got a call from Brian. And Brian said that he was going to be taking a well-deserved break and asked me if, if I would be willing to speak this Sunday. And I said, yes. And I asked him, uh, is there something specific you'd want me to speak on, or, or are we still going to be going through the, the growing uh, series? And he said, I'm not sure. I'll get back to you. Well, a few days later, I got an email from Brian. And the email said, we're going to stay in the growing series, and would you speak about evangelism and sharing your faith? And I must admit, Hearing that, I got a little bit uncomfortable. I emailed Brian back and said, sure, I'll speak on that, but be aware that I don't see one of my spiritual gifts as evangelism. And that sometimes when I hear about evangelism, there are some images that go through my mind that make me a little uncomfortable. Images of standing on a street corner and preaching images of having pockets full of literature and handing it out, and I've done that many times. Images of going door to door and knocking on doors and inviting people to, to go to church, uh, and I've done that too. In fact, one time I was even stopped by the local police accused of being a peeping Tom. Uh, I wasn't, they were looking for someone else in the area at the same time. There are lots of things about evangelism that, that do make me a little uncomfortable. Sometimes I think I've tried to argue people into the kingdom of God. That didn't work. Sometimes people have called me closed-minded, and maybe I am. And sometimes, to be completely honest, I was probably just a little obnoxious. That's not what we want to talk about this morning. You see, Brian was right. When we talk about growing in our faith, we talk about things like studying scripture, applying scripture, solitude, prayer, fasting, community, all the things that Brian has been talking about over the past several weeks. But if we're going to be growing in our faith, we also need to be sharing our faith, sharing it with other people. When you read through the New Testament, you'll see all kinds of verses that talk about that concept. This certainly isn't all of them, but you can see the words that are used there. They appear over and over again. We're to be a witness. We are to preach. We are to be ambassadors. We're to be evangelists. We're to give an answer to anyone who asks us a question. You see, sharing our faith is important. But I think it's fair to ask the question, how do we do that? When do we do that? What do we need to say? And how do we say it? Well, I found when we ask those kinds of questions, one of the best ways to answer them is to start to look at the New Testament and ask, how did the everyday, ordinary people in the New Testament share their faith with other individuals? And the answer to that question is many different ways. Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch on the road, and they had a Bible study together. Peter, Stephen, Paul, they were all preachers. And in their messages, they shared their faith and what faith in Jesus Christ meant. And throughout the New Testament, we're told to pray for other people and pray that they come to know Jesus Christ. But there is another way throughout the New Testament where people shared their faith. And that was they simply shared their story. Sharing our faith is very much like sharing our story. In fact, it is sharing our story. Think about it. 
when the blind man received his sight, he went to his friends and his family and those who knew him best. And what did he say? I was blind, but now I see. The lame got up and walked. And those who knew them best saw what had happened. And they knew what God had done. The lepers were healed, and other people with illnesses were healed. And they went back to their families, to their friends, to the people in their communities, and said, God, through Jesus Christ, did for me what I could never have done for myself. God, through Jesus Christ, did for me what I could never have done for myself. And it wasn't just physical healings. It was emotional. It was spiritual. It was ethical healings as well. Think of the woman at the well that Jesus confronted and spoke with. The woman who had had five husbands. After that conversation, what did she tell those who knew her best? He told me everything I ever had done. He had touched her life, and she shared it with those who knew her best. Think of the Apostle Paul. He didn't just preach. He shared his story. Three times in the book of Acts is the story of Paul's conversion. Two of those times, he's sharing it with other people, sharing his story, sharing how he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior and as his Lord. So this morning, I would like to ask your permission to share a little bit of my story. My story will be different than your story. We've had different experiences. We've grown up in different places. We've had different friends, different contexts, and we're wired differently as people. But the end of each of our stories, if we know who Jesus Christ is, will be the same. It will be that God, through Jesus Christ, did for me what I could not have done for myself. In high school, there was only one word to describe me. I was a nerd. In fact, I still am. And you may think that I take that as an insult when someone calls me a nerd. Actually, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> See, already. <laughs> in high school, I didn't work on cars or, or play on the football team. I learned about slide rules. My freshman year of high school, I built my first computer a ham radio as a sophomore, a remote data acquisition system as a junior, and I tracked satellites as a senior. I took every math and science course that was offered. I lived in the science wing of the high school, literally. They gave me my own office when I was a junior and a senior. <laughs> it was a converted storeroom. It had a window to the outside, and instead of going to lunch or uh, study halls, I went to my office and played around with the things that, that I was toying with. I carried a briefcase for my books. See, I told you I was a nerd. <laughs> uh, that's right. It'll get worse, believe me. That is what I was. I never went to a dance. I never went to the prom. I never went on a date. But that doesn't mean I was antisocial or a loner. I had good friends. And while I was building computers and radios and satellite trackers, they were building telescopes, photo labs, uh, sunspot tracking, wind tunnels. We were all the same. We were nerds. And it's only logical 
that as I left high school and wanted to go off to college, I needed to go to a school that was for nerds. And I found one. Few people had ever heard of it. A little school in Terre Haute, Indiana, Rose Polytechnic Institute. No one's ever heard of it. 1,100 guys. Remember what I just said there. <laughs> guys. No women were allowed. It was an interesting school where everyone either majored in math, chemistry, physics, or engineering. If you didn't want to be an engineer, you didn't go there. During my time at Rose, I took 68 classes. Eight were humanities classes. Six were military science classes. Army ROTC was mandatory. And 52 were technical classes in engineering, math, or science. I loved it. For the humanities classes and military science classes, the final exams were two hours long. For all of the technical classes, the final exams were four hours long. The administration knew what it was like to have a school full of nerds and what things would be like at the end of the semester, particularly with respect to health investigations of the campus. So we were required to wear coat and tie to dinner at the dining hall once a week, just so that they knew we would clean ourselves up a little bit. <laughs> and there was maid service in the dorms that cleaned our rooms and changed our sheets every week. It was needed, believe me. <laughs> Rose was a very interesting place. We were all nerds. And probably nothing describes Rose better than our school song. It went something like this, and no, I am not going to try to sing it. I'm just going to say the words. Dear old Rose, the sweetest flower that grows, here's to your colors, rose and white. Here's to the men who've kept them bright. Colors true for men who honor you. Here's to everything you've done. Here's to every fight you've won. Dear old Rose. E to the X, dy dx, E to the X, dx. Cosine, cosine tangent, secant sine, 3.14159. <laughs> Slipstick, T square, bogey factor two. Dear old Rose, we love you. Hardly on Wisconsin. <laughs> we were nerds, and we loved it. When I moved into the freshman dorm, there was a guy across the hall from me. His name was Kent. And Kent wanted to go to church on Sunday morning. Rose didn't provide transportation into town. It was four miles away. We were on the outskirts of Terre Haute. And there was no way to get to town other than to hitchhike. But Kent wanted to go to church. And he picked out a church, not for any great theological reasons, but because it was located on Kent Avenue in Terre Haute. And he thought he might as well go to a church that was on the same street that he was, his name was. So he was going to hitchhike into town. And my parents had drilled into me that I was never to hitchhike alone. I could hitchhike, but I always had to hitchhike with someone else. So I volunteered to hitchhike into town with Kent. And that was probably a good idea. Not only were there three colleges and universities in Terre Haute, Rose Polytechnic Institute, Indiana State University, and St. Mary's of the Woods, a Catholic girls college. But there were also three federal penitentiaries, a minimum security, a maximum security, and a supermax facility where the federal death row was located. So hitchhiking together was probably a good idea. So we started to hitchhike to church together on, on Sunday mornings. Sometimes the pastor of the church, a former Terre Haute police captain, would pick us up and, and take us to church uh, as well. 
And we got to know each other quite well. And we got kind of comfortable in the church. And shortly before finals that first quarter, when tensions were kind of high, the church had a series of special meetings throughout the, night, uh, throughout the week, each evening. And Kent and I decided to go into one or two of those meetings uh, just to see what was going on. Well, I can't remember who spoke, and I can't even remember what he said. But after the service, I was just kind of standing around. Kent was talking to the pastor of the church, and I noticed an older gentleman in the back of the room. And I knew who he was because I had met him before. He was the pastor of another church in Terre Haute. But he was not only the pastor of another church in Terre Haute, his son at that time was the longest living heart transplant patient in the United States. And this was in the early days of heart transplants. So I went up to Lewis Russell, Reverend Russell, and started a conversation. I asked him how his son was doing. And he said he's doing pretty well. And he said, but he's getting a little anxious. He wants to get back to his work being an industrial arts teacher at an inner city high school in Indianapolis. He wanted to get back to work working with his students and helping move them forward in their lives. So we chatted a little bit. And then Reverend Russell looked at me and out of the blue turned the whole discussion around. He looked at me and said, John, do you have a new heart? I was somewhat taken aback by the question and wasn't quite sure how to answer. And he took that opportunity at that little split second in time to put his arm around me and say, let's sit down and talk about this. And at that point in time, he shared with me that God through Jesus Christ could do for me what I could never do for myself. That he gave his life for me and that he purchased new life for me. Where I had death, he provided me with eternal life. Where I had no hope, he provided me hope. Where I lacked purpose, he gave me direction. Where I could not forgive myself, he provided forgiveness. And that night, I came to know Jesus Christ. I told Kent about that, that evening, and now there were two of us. The next night, Kent's roommate went along with us. And where my process had taken weeks and months, that night, Kent's roommate, Dan, accepted the Lord as well and found new life in Jesus Christ. There were now three of us. We went back and took those four-hour final exams. We survived. We went on our Christmas break, and we came back for our second quarter. We discovered two more fellows in the dorm, Tom and Tom. They were roommates. It gets a little confusing with Tom and Tom, but by then, Army ROTC had worn off enough on us that uh, we called one Black and one Mills, and that was... We all were going by last names at that point. So we, there were now five of us. Kent, Dan, John, Tom, and Tom. And I'm not even sure who suggested it, but the suggestion was made that maybe we should have a Bible study together during the week. We thought it was a good idea. So we decided to have a Bible study at 8 o'clock on Tuesday nights in one of our dorm rooms. You might ask, what is significant about Tuesday night and why did we choose it? That was the day the maids changed the rooms 
and we knew the beds were made and there'd be some place to sit. So for three or four weeks, we met and had a Bible study. And then one day, Kent, Dan, and I got notes in our campus mailboxes. The note said that we needed to come and see Professor Wayne. Now, Professor Wayne wasn't a teacher we had yet. We knew we would have him. He taught all the statistics courses at the school. And we didn't know why he wanted to see us. So we made an appointment, and the three of us went to see Professor Wayne. We arrived in his office, and we said, hi, we're here, you know, what's up? And he said, I was driving to uh, campus the other day, listening to the Christian radio station in town, which happened to be owned by the pastor of the church we were going to, and heard on the radio that there was going to be starting a Bible study in one of the dorms at Rose. He called the radio station, talked to Reverend Huey, and Reverend Huey gave, us, gave him our three names. He wrote us a note, put it in our campus mailboxes, and we came to see him. And he looked at us and said, can I come? You don't tell a future professor, no, you can't come to a Bible <laughs> study. We said, sure. So he started showing up every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock in a freshman dormitory for a Bible study. Let me tell you, that was the best advertising for a Bible study that you possibly could get. Suddenly, everybody's asking, what is a professor doing here at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night every week? So now there were six of us. And as that Bible study continued, we saw four other guys come to know who Jesus Christ was and is. They discovered that God, through Jesus Christ, had done something for them that they could not do for themselves. That was the end of our freshman year. There were 10 of us. Professor Wayne had told us that there were a group of students at Indiana State that were meeting every Friday night, that someone in Terre Haute would open their home, a family, on a rotating basis and invite those students in to talk, to have a Bible study, to sing, and to have some food together. And Professor Wayne said, you know, you guys would be welcome to come as well. So three or four of us went, start of our sophomore year, to visit what was called an open house. And what we soon discovered was that of the 10 or 15 Indiana State students that were there, probably two-thirds of them were girls. Hey, I said we were nerds, not monks, okay? <laughs> Suddenly, the word got back to Rose that there's something going on Friday night and there's more girls than guys. <laughs> so suddenly, the number of guys coming from Rose rapidly increased. And as soon as the guys coming from Rose rapidly increased, the number of girls coming from Indiana State rapidly increased. And as soon as that increased, the guys increased. By the end of our sophomore year, there were 70 or 80 students bombarding these people's homes to talk, to sing, to eat, to have a Bible study. We had Bible studies in kitchens, bedrooms, bathrooms, living rooms, dining rooms, eight or nine going all together at the same time. Now, a lot of the fellows from Rose hadn't accepted Christ yet. They hadn't come to realize that God had done something for them through Jesus Christ that they couldn't do for themselves. 
But through that process, they started to see that reality. And they started to see the reality in our lives because we weren't strangers inviting them into some place. We were the guys they lived with on a daily basis. They knew we weren't perfect. They knew we debated a lot of issues with respect to theology and churches and evolution and science and creation, all of those things. They knew we didn't agree on politics and the Vietnam War, but they knew at the end of the day, we all had the same story, that Jesus Christ had done something for me that I could not do for myself. And by the end of the year, there weren't 10 of us. There were now 20 of us. I should also point out that many of us, myself included, found our wives at those open houses. At the end of our sophomore year, Professor Wayne left and took a position at Oral Roberts University. We were kind of on our own. And we decided that in addition to a Bible study, we should start to pray regularly. And we went to the, to the fellow who managed the Holman Memorial Union, the union on campus, and asked if we could have a room every day, all year. And he said, sure. And we met from noon to 12.30, five days a week, and we prayed. Not all of us all the time. There were usually maybe eight to 10 of us that would get together. And we prayed for ourselves. We prayed for our friends in the dorm. We prayed for final exams. We prayed for our relationship with girls. We prayed for our professors. We prayed for Rose. But most of all, we prayed that those who had not yet come to know Jesus Christ would come to know that God, through Jesus Christ, had done something for them that they could not do for themselves. By the end of the junior year, there were 30 of us. We were getting pretty bold by that point. We were seniors, the five of us, and we thought we pretty much had this whole thing figured out. And most of us had one humanities elective that we still had to fulfill to be able to graduate. We had taken the course, six courses, had one elective already, but now we needed to have another one. So we decided that we needed to have a humanities elective that had something to do with spiritual issues. We knew that we couldn't probably get credit for having a Bible study. Uh, humanities department, that simply wouldn't fly. And we probably couldn't do a course on theology, but we got to thinking, maybe we could have a course on history. And we decided that we were gonna develop a course that we would teach and we would give credit for and it would be our course. And we called it Comparative American Religious Movements. The only challenge was we had to get approval to do the course. And the idea is we would invite in different speakers to share about their religious movement and then we would interrogate them in the classroom and we would all learn together. We were gonna have, cover Judaism, Catholicism, Christian science, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, mainline Protestants, evangelicals, and the Jesus people. That was our little, little group that we all put together. So we went to the head of the humanities department, Gordon Haste, he never moved that fast, even though his name was Haste. <laughs> and he kind of shook his head and said, well, that's interesting. But all of the professors that I have in my department are fully booked for this quarter. And you need to have a professor to at least supervise the class. I don't have any professors, so the humanities department can't provide you what you need. 
if there's any other professors in the school, you'll need to go talk to the dean of the faculty and see if he has any professors. I think Professor Hayes thought, well, I got rid of that one. Uh, they're all done. Little did he know. We went to see Dean Chris, the dean of the faculty. He basically said exactly the same thing that Professor Haste had said. Don't have anyone to supervise the course. There won't be a course. And then he said, unless you can get the vice president of administration and faculty and of student of vice president of academics, sorry, to agree and find you a faculty member, this won't happen. We knew we had it made at that point. The vice president of academic affairs was a fellow by the name of Herman Munch. He had a goatee, wire rim glasses, and a forever smile. He entered Rose as a freshman in 1924. This was now 1972. In those 49 years, he only left once, and that was for one year to get an advanced degree at the University of Michigan. He was the nerd's nerd. <laughs> he never said no to a student, and he never said no to a good idea. He taught he had taught at the electrical engineering department. He had been the head of the electrical engineering department. He had been dean of the faculty. Twice he had been the interim president of a school. We were his family. Still, 49 years later, he insisted on teaching a freshman introductory course to every student that came into the school. It was on graphical communications and computer programming. We were his kids. He never married. He drove a Porsche. He was quite the fellow. His instructions for when he died was not only did he want his name on his tombstone or his gravestone, he wanted his ham radio call on there as well. <laughs> he smiled. He laughed, he said this was a great idea, and that he would solve the problem for us. And he said he had just the solution for us. Rose had a cooperative agreement with St. Mary's of the Woods, Catholic Girls School, that we would send math and physics professors to them, and they would send humanities professors to us. And they owed us a few professors. So he borrowed a professor from St. Mary's of the Woods to supervise our course. A few weeks later, we got a note in our mailboxes. It was from Dean Munch. And he said, I found your professor. Here's his phone number. He's at St. Mary's of the Woods. And his name is Father William Steinman. He was a Catholic priest. We kind of scratched our heads about that a little bit, but realized he could teach the session on Catholicism, which he did. We met with him and explained that all he would have to do was do that one session on Catholicism, show up every week, and grade the final exam. We were going to write the final exam ourselves, not him. That's one way to control what your grade is pretty easily. <laughs> the class went well. The Jewish rabbi came in, a Mormon elder, a Christian science reader, someone from the Jehovah Witnesses. Father Steinman spoke on Catholicism. Uh, a campus pastor spoke on uh, mainline Protestantism. Uh, an evangelical pastor in town spoke. And then we got to the final session of the course. And we had left Jesus people to the end. It was a growing movement in the 1970s and it was exciting, and a lot of people were talking about it. Jesus people even made the cover of Time Magazine in terms of, of the impact they were having on the country. We invited in another campus pastor who had been working on various campuses with, with Jesus people, 
His name was Brett. And Brett came in and spoke about the history of the Jesus people, how that they really had come out of the uh, countercultural movement in the country, the young people who had, had really discovered the, the, the vacuum and the void of, of, of what was going on in their lives and how there was really no good answer and had kind of checked out and looked for, for meaning in, in drugs and in sex and communal life together, but then discovered that that didn't have any meaning and fulfillment either. And that had discovered that really the only true meaning and fulfillment in life came by recognizing that God through Jesus Christ had done something for them that they could not do for themselves. And then Brett asked the question, what do these people believe? And he turned around, and every classroom it rose, and this was kind of a big lecture hall. There were 40 or 50 of us in the class. There was a green board. At Rose, there's blackboards and green boards everywhere. I kid you not, they're even in the toilet stalls. You've got to write out your problem somewhere, right? So anyway, Brett turned to the blackboard, picked up a piece of chalk, and on the right side of the board, he wrote the word God. And he said, in the beginning was God. He was here at the start. He created everything. And then he took the chalk again and drew a stick figure of a man next to God. And he said, God created man in his own image. And when he created man, man was in a relationship with God a close relationship, a relationship of oneness, where they had fellowship with each other. And that man and woman were there and God was with them. But then something happened, and he took his eraser and he erased the stick figure, and then he drew it on the other side of the blackboard, or the green board. Man was separate from God says in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. We decided not to do it God's way. We decided to do it our way. And every man and woman, from the first man and woman to all of us today, have created that separation, a separation between us. And that separation has implications and those implications are that we can't get back to God. Isaiah 59.2 continues and says, Your inequities have made a separation between you and your God. And in Romans 6.23, Paul writes, The wages of sin is death. There was now a gap between man and God. And no matter how good man was, he couldn't bridge that gap. Some of us would barely fall over the side if we tried to jump across that gap. Maybe if you were an Olympic broad jumper, you might get a quarter of the way across. But no one could get across to God. There was a problem. Blaise Pascal, the famous mathematician, said, inside every man there is a vacuum, a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. And God acted, and he acted in a way that solved man's problems. But the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God built a bridge between man and himself. He created the solution. And he offers us that opportunity. How do we get back to God? We walk across that bridge. We acknowledge our rebellion. We ask for his forgiveness. And we accept his gift 
of free life and life with God. Brett explained that this is what the Jesus people believed. This is how they found meaning in their life. And he said, they discovered that God, through Jesus Christ, did for them what they could not do for themselves. And he finished. One hand went up in the classroom, quickly. It was the hand of Father Steinman. Some of us held our breaths, said a quiet prayer. And Brett said, yes, sir. And Father Steinman said, thank you. I have been a Catholic priest for nearly 30 years. And that is the clearest, most concise, and accurate picture of what the Christian message is that I have ever heard. God did for me what I could not have done for myself. He did it through Jesus Christ. After the class was over, Father Steinman asked Brett for his notes. The original five of us graduated two weeks later, and things changed. And over the years, things have changed at Rose as well. It's no longer Rose Polytechnic Institute. It is now Rose Holman. No longer 1,100 students, 2,400 students today. 30% are female. Like I say, things change. Finals are still four hours long. Um, Army ROTC is no longer mandatory. But all of the students, male and female, are still nerds. <laughs> in fact, in a recent college guidebook, there was an interview of a Rose student. And the quote was, we're all nerds. It's just that some of us hide it better than others. <laughs> but things, some things at Rose didn't change. They are still all nerds. They did change the school song to be gender, gender neutral and got rid of the references to slide rules, which became calculators and T-squares, which became CAD programs. But one thing didn't change. Also, there's still housekeeping service that changes the sheets and, the, and cleans the rooms. They still know what nerds are like. But one thing didn't change, and that is that there is still a group of students on that campus, praying, having Bible studies, talking to their friends and neighbors, sharing their lives in a very real sense with them, and communicating to them their stories, each one different, but each one ending with the fact that God, through Jesus Christ, did for them what they could not do for themselves. This morning, that's true for us as well. If we're going to be growing Christians, we need to grow in our sharing of our faith. And how do we do that? We do it by sharing our story, by praying, by taking the opportunities that come before us, but most of all, sharing our stories. And our stories will be different. We're all different people. But if we know and have accepted Jesus Christ, that is how each of our stories will end. That God did through Jesus Christ for me what I could never have done for myself. In a moment, I'd like you to pray with me. And I'd like to pray for you that you can tell your stories, that you can share that story with other people, with people that you are close to. 
And I would like to just close with one small passage from the book of Mark. It's a story of Jesus healing a man possessed with demons. The demons were driven into a herd of pigs. And the herdsmen shared this story all over the countryside. But when that man who had been healed came to Jesus, he wanted to go and be and follow Jesus. And this is what Matthew 5, 18 to 20 says. As he was getting into the boat, Jesus, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on them, on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. I'd like to ask you all to stand for a moment. And if you know Jesus Christ, I'd like you to repeat with me that statement as I read it. God, through Jesus Christ, did for me what I could never have done for myself. A little more excitement in your voice, okay? <laughs> God, through Jesus Christ, did for me what I could never have done for myself. Let's pray. Father, we only stand in awe of you that you built a bridge that could bring us back to yourself. We acknowledge our separation. We acknowledge that it was caused by our own rebellion. And it just blows our mind that you solved our problem that we simply couldn't solve. Father, I pray that each of us may feel the freedom to be able to share our story. Father, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes long. It can be 30 seconds long. But at the same time, we know that it will end up that you did for us what we never could have done for ourselves. And for that, we simply say thank you. In your name, amen.